That Naturopathic Podcast. TNP. Hello there. Hi, and thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Michelle Pobega, naturopathic doctor. And I'm Dr. David Miller, ND, and we hear your frustrations. This show is for you. This show is for you if you're feeling like your current healthcare strategy is not getting to the root cause or the underlying reasons for your health. This show is for you if you've been told that you're fine, but you definitely don't feel very well. This show is for you if you're walking out of your doctor's office with one, two, three, four, or even five medications without any mention of diet, lifestyle, or a long-term game plan. This show is for you if you've got several specialists taking care of you, but no one is really putting all the pieces together. This show is for you if you believe that health should be part of healthcare. These problems have solutions. We know it. Our patients know it. And we want you to know it. Naturopathic medicine is the solution that you should know about. Hello, and welcome to another episode of That Naturopathic Podcast. I'm Dr. Michelle Pobega. I am flying solo, and it's just a a nice little short episode um, because something stands out this week about a patient visit that I had, and I kind of wanted to share that with the audience. So I had a new patient. Uh, He was a retired older gentleman. Um, He came to me with main concerns of some arthritic issues, uh, cholesterol and some diabetes, both of which are managed with pharmaceuticals at this stage, but probably still not managed enough because I still have to wait to see blood work, um, overweight rashes, headaches. He's had an aneurysm. He wears a sleep apnea machine, uh, when he sleeps, but at the very height of his concerns was recurring infections. And he had a, uh, this type of infection maybe about a year ago, and then he had another one just literally at the beginning of the new year and ended up having to be hospitalized. And then since that moment, in his words, he was chronically constipated and has not been able to have a bowel movement um, regularly. Um, and after the round of antibiotics and and discharge from the hospital, he was advised to repeat the urinalysis to assess if there's still any kind of microbial things in uh, the urine, because that's where the infection was, was in bladder. And they were still there. So they put him on another round of antibiotics. So when we start unpacking his health history, it seems that he's also had a history of ear infections. He had one year of severe ear infections, like recurring. Um, And his wife was able to corroborate that he's probably taken an antibiotic at least, at least once a year for now, a number of years. So this is where I want to, and this is the type of education I had to provide for my patient. And I thought, well, I guess our audience could benefit from this as well. When you start getting recurring infections and start requiring antibiotics, and then something else happens, and anti- even if it doesn't show up in the same area of the initial infection, if you're getting recurrent infections that require a deeper medical intervention or an antibiotic, I want you to stop And also think about prevention and what led you to this. And, you know, without, with obviously a level of bias, go work with a functional medicine doctor or a naturopathic doctor to understand how you can recover your microbiome. So here's the, here's the take home. He also ate a lot of sugar as a kid. So already then I've, I'm seeing that he had probably microbial issues because he just ate a lot of sugar. He admitted to that. He's like, my mom did not give us good nutrition. We ate a lot of garbage. He had his appendix removed when he was 15, somewhere between the age of 15 or 20. And then there were these recurring infections in his adult life. So if it's not obvious to the audience, you need to assess your microbiome. So all that sugar likely created a bit of a dysbiosis. He might've also had some other infections that maybe he's not remembering in his childhood. Who who knows? At this point in time, probably not that big of a deal. However, he did have his appendix removed. When your appendix is removed, you now do not have a backup reservoir of beneficial bacteria to replenish your gut microbiome after infection. That little vestigial organ is not something that is just a throwaway organ. 
similar to how I feel about the gallbladder. Neither of those things are little throwaway organs. However, I understand when you have acute appendicitis, sometimes there needs to be an emergency situation and acute care taking, uh, taken to resolve that. However, your appendix is lymphoid tissue. It is a really integral part of our immune system, and it is meant to be a reservoir of microbes to help re-inoculate your intestinal tract after an infection. So there were already various red flags. And I had to explain that, you know, sometimes if we've been on rounds and rounds of antibiotics, we may ne never fully recover the lost beneficial bacteria. Um, I remember a while back learning this, and I don't know if um, this is still the statistic. And I really hope that I'm not misquoting it and I don't, I'm not remembering it skewed, but I do remember learning that depending on the type of antibiotic you're having, the doses, the severity of things, um, and the strength and the potency of the antibiotic, sometimes it might wipe out the bacteria effectively. Yes. The pathogenic bacteria, but it's not, it's not preferential to just bad bacteria. An antibiotic doesn't discriminate between the good and the bad bacteria. And sometimes it can then clear or clean the slate from an antimicrobial perspective quite aggressively. And I, ha I remember for some reason in my mind from some kind of conference years ago that this could lead to GI microbial vulnerability for up to eight months because it might clear things and have that long of an impact on the gut microbiome after. In which case, if your beneficial bacteria and your beneficial microbiome has been completely thrown off or certain microbes eliminated or completely eradicated, you have now left a vulnerability in your gut ecosystem, which also translates to your immune system, your body's ability to regulate inflammation, your body's ability to regulate pH balance, your body's ab uh, ability to regulate your metabolism and blood sugar regulation, uh, the ability to digest bile, the ability to uh, absorb various or create, um, help with the production of certain nutrients and the absorption of nutrients, the ability to detoxify. If you have for whatever reasons, and there are reasons to take antibiotics, this is not an anti-antibiotic rant, but if you have taken them and you have then altered your gut microbiome, you have now left a vulnerability with possibly reduced beneficial microbes. And that now creates an environment that allows more pathogenic microbes to take up more space or allows those opportunistic microbes to start to take up more space than they should. So opportunistic microbes are things like yeast. And we have certain strains of E. coli in our system, and they are a natural part of our ecosystem, but they are meant to be kept within a certain balance. So when they start to overgrow or allow or be given an environment in which they can thrive, they might start to then lead to other breakdown in health and health symptoms or, or, or disease symptoms. So when we start having recurring infections, number one, we are altering the gut microbiome every single time and it needs to be supported. But number two, I remember also again at a medical conference where they were talking about biofilms and stealth pathogens. And they said with ear infections, they did a study bunch of people had ear infections, given them antibiotics. And then when they went to go investigate the microbial load on the surface, it appeared as if the microbes were eradicated by the antibiotic. But upon further and deeper investigation, they found that the bacteria had gone more into a stealth or a deeper integration into the system with also the help of biofilms to help protect them. So this is now where you now have a protective polysaccharide coating on your microbes. And a lot of times more than one bacteria, like more than one pathogen can kind of hide within a, a, a biofilm. Um, they all kind of help each other create this polysaccharide coating and then they share DNA and food and, and they kind of like support each other to survive. So it's not just bacteria, but now you have this protective barrier, which 
intercept the ability of say like an antibiotic, whether it's herbal or pharmaceutical and its receptors or, or, or external proteins and molecules to be able to identify and interact with certain receptor sites or molecules on the microbes, because you have this polysaccharide biofilm in between those things. So now an antimicrobial or an antibiotic is not going to be as effective as getting the, the, the actual pathogenic burden of microbes in the system because of this biofilm. And then that's kind of what we would start to say as like stealth stealth pathogens, because now they've buried themselves or they've managed to bury themselves deeper into your system. And they may not always show themselves, but you might find that you're that person that starts to get cyclic infections. Or when you get a cold, you're easy to get bronchitis or pneumonia or sinus, chronic sinusitis or you know urinary tract infections or whatever it is. But this is where we start getting that chronic infection cycle happening. <clears throat> I don't know if there is any studies or a number of like, how many rounds of antibiotics do you need for microbes to go into stealth mode? I imagine that it's probably variable based on the terrain of the human in which those microbes are existing in. Um, so I, for, 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 for this patient, my highest priority was to educate him about how important the microbiome was and how it is going to influence his cholesterol and his diabetes and his weight and likely his rashes and headaches and immune system and inflammation and joint pain and et cetera, et cetera, because of how the microbiome operates. But my concern and how my concern was because of the recent really high end or 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 intense intervention that required hospitalization for antibiotics and then he got constipated it was like well now you're really not getting rid of garbage and now you're creating like a nice little fecal retreat vacation spot for these microbes to just like have a party on um, because it's not coming out of your system. I was like, well, that's a problem. Um, and then when we started talking, he's like, oh yeah, my bowels has always moved. And I was like, okay, well, what was the regularity of them? And he was like, probably like every other day. He's like, but I was never constipated. And I said, I'm going to correct you. If you're only going every other day and not at minimum once a day, you sir are constipated. And he was flabbergasted at this comment. He had no idea. So we began by a, getting his, his hydration was really good in spite of the constipation. Um, so I said, continue our optimal hydration levels. His diet could have been better. Like he started his day with a bowl of Cheerios or a piece of toast with peanut butter, occasionally had eggs. So I educated him on having to focus on protein and getting color and fibers and stuff to start his day. Because with someone who has cholesterol issues, diabetes, weight gain, and obviously inflammation in his joints, you can't be starting your day with something that basically just turns into sugar. And again, that was wildly new information to him. And nobody explained that to him before. So I said, we need to set the tone better to not just feed the beasts with excessive amounts of sugar right from the jump. Um, his dinners always included vegetables. Well, when I asked and pressed a little bit further about portions on the plate, uh, the vegetables were not even close to a priority. So we are going to, uh, I, I was specific on how I wanted like the portions on his plate to look like if they were looking like a pie chart, uh, to increase his nutrient intake, fiber intake, um, antioxidant intake and reduce his stress on, carbs and sorry, blood sugar response, but also all that good fiber is not only going to get his bowels moving better, but it's also going to feed and further influence a, a recovery as best as we can of his internal microbiome. And then we gave him some magnesium citrate because I was like, I need to get your poops moving. And I was like, that might also improve some of your sleep. Magnesium is also great for blood sugar. Like I'm trying to hit a few birds with one stone. We also had him start with a really, really slow and low dose of psyllium. Sometimes going too hard on psyllium or metamucil will create more constipation, but I wanted to get his fiber um, and ben uh, beneficial prebiotics and fiber a little bit more of a push, but we're starting like really, really slow dose. And, uh, he was instructed to only increase as he felt his tolerance was okay to do so. Um, 
And then we added in some like really high potency probiotics. I mean, giving a probiotic is still transient because as you have a bowel movement, you lose microbes and things shift again. So giving a probiotic isn't going to solve all its problems, but at least it's going to start to have good microbes take up more space in his gut microbiome and hopefully further prevent another bladder infection. He and his wife were very concerned about bladder infection prevention, especially since they have a trip coming up and they want to be able to enjoy it. So I gave him instructions that would allow them to do a high dose of things now. And then also some things to take on the trip to protect his microbiome. And, uh, that's it. We didn't do a fancy protocol. There was no detox protocols. There was no liver support. There was no cholesterol and blood sugar management. He came in specifically with the bladder infections. And I was like, well, that's the right place to start. But first we have to get you pooping and we get got your, got to get your gut microbiome in check. Cause if that's not happy and good, that will influence the microbiome in other areas of your body. So we need to ensure that the majority of your microbiome, which resides in your gut, is in a healthier space. And we continue to try to do things to encourage a healthier gut microbiome. Because like I said, and I'll say it again, it influences all the other pathogens and microbes in all the other areas of our, of our body. And you can continue to focus on the urinary tract. You can continue to focus on your sinuses. You can continue to focus on ear infections, but at the end of the day, you still need to treat the gut microbiome and you need to support that advantageously. Fibers, uh, antioxidants, greens, um, uh, sometimes probiotic rich foods. We didn't get into that with him, but I was like, let's just start simple. Let's start spacing your portions better on your plate. Let's start not having a super carby breakfast that turns into sugar. Let's get a few more balanced meals in there on a general, on a general basis. Let's get some good bacteria in, flood the system to see if we can start to like shift the space that pathogenic and opportunistic microbes are taking and get the bowels moving. But the real take home is that this whole, this whole experience with this gentleman reminded me that a lot of people don't realize why they get chronic infections. A lot of people don't understand how to begin to nip that in the bud. And it always, for me, goes back to your gut. It might still require, you know, for women, you might still require a vaginal suppository. Like there might require some other things, but at the end of the day, it always goes back to your gut if you're getting chronic infections. And just sitting back and being like, it's okay, I'll just take another antibiotic. I, I just want to stress how concerning that type of thought process is that if I just get infection, I'll get an antibiotic because every time you take an antibiotic, we start to affect our internal microbiome, which is so incredibly important. So please be responsible with your health. And if you find that you are leaning towards this trajectory, or you know, someone who is in this space where they tend to get infection and then another infection and yearly infections, please advise that they work with a naturopath or at the very least a functional medicine doctor to help them rebuild a healthier, more resilient digestive system and gut and microbiome so that their body can defend itself and not allow for recurring infections to happen. Anyways, that is my talk based on being inspired by sharing with the audience what I shared with my new patient. And I felt like if if he needed to hear some new information and it was insightful and um, unique according to his point of view, but helpful, I felt that other people probably would benefit from that as well. So that's that. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Have yourself a beautiful week and tune in again and again and again week after week because we love you guys and we appreciate all the little comments you leave. And uh, we just really love to be able to put this information out there. So thanks for tuning in.